morning, morning, morning. This is Paul from AAC. Today it's update time on our Max Peninsula. Just thought today we would cover how it's progressing, the water test results. There should be some new additions as well today as we start to look at things like cleanup crew and more soft corals, maybe a fish as well. But let's talk about test results. Obviously the last time we left this, it was just going through its early phases. We left it showing you with just as a pile of rocks and some fresh seawater mixed with some old. But I have to say the tanks matured exactly as I thought it would. There was no ammonia, there was no nitrite. We'd never found a single trace whatsoever. That shows you really the difference when you're using live rock. It appears that the Walt Smith Fiji live rock has definitely carried over enough aerobic bacteria to keep it stable. And the current test results that we've got, we're focusing on predominantly at the moment is alkalinity and phosphate, because now we have, as you can see, corals in there already. Well, it's three weeks in, no ammonia, no nitrite. As it stands currently at the moment, the phosphate, I believe, is about 0.02. And on calcium, Calcium's 440. Calcium's 440. And the DKH of 6.6. .6. So as you can tell, it started maturing already. There is some nitrate to suggest that there's been conversion from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. So we're we're matured. So at this particular moment in time, one of the big issues we're finding is, is that it's running out of nutrients. Because I've already added quite a few soft corals, which I'll come on to later those soft corals will be utilising any waste or any uh, nutrients that are present in there. So along with using the Red Sea test kit range, we're also using the reef energy to provide some form of organic waste in a way. Yeah, because obviously reef energy will work by adding aminos and a basic coral food, but really, all we're really interested in is actually adding a nutrient. Reef energy does that very well. Nowadays there's a lot of engineered coral foods on the market and some add phosphate and some don't. In fact some are found to even potentially lower phosphate, just like the Benny Reef. So in this particular situation we really want to be adding nutrients, not removing them. At 0.02 PO4 with a soft coral tank is quite low. It's more akin to a stony coral aquarium. Uh, so one of my favourite early products from Red Sea is KH Coral Line Grow, which is a mixture of an alkalinity supplement and also an iodine, and I think there might be a traces of iron as well in it, in order to encourage coral line algae. Once we've got the building blocks for coral line algae, then we know we're really in the right place because that shows how the system's maturing properly. We like to test things and use products as they're needed. And sometimes you can find different products for different reasons. Reef energy, I always find, lets your corals tick over whilst there are, say, nutrient deficiencies. So if you had a very, very high nutrient situation, you need to stop adding nutrients and so let the test kits do the talking and not the salesman we always say in AAC. How you learn to become a great reefer is by understanding the products you buy and any good dealer if you call into your local LFS should be able to explain particularly if they're a Red Sea dealer exactly what these things do. They're not snake oil so you need to be careful at times and other times you need to be a little bit less careful but today I thought to do a little bit on the livestock first and then we'll come back to adding the products later on. They will leave a slight cloud just after usage. One of the things perhaps we should talk about is what is it that we are actually doing in terms of the filter chamber. Well, we, we did actually remove the filter foam out of it temporarily. We may put that back in, but we didn't want to constrict the flow at all in any way at the moment. And because we're using live rock, we've actually got good aerobic bacteria so in the rear chamber as it stands, it's exactly as we left it in the last video. There is actually just the heater, just the protein skimmer, relatively detuned. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can have a little look at that. It's skimming a little bit, you can see there, it's a light liquid, um, nice dry foam. Remember I said about skimmers and the quality of skimmers. Now look, you know, you can do the old uh, 
test there, the meringue test. The foam's lovely and dry. Yeah, the skimmer looks like it will need a clean today. I would say that's doing a pretty damn good job. Probably just removing the last of what's coming out the live rock. Whenever you introduce an organic, rich product like live rock to clean seawater, you will see there'll be some further decay, if you like. So, oh yeah, it smells. I can smell that already. Love a, love a skimmer smell first thing in the morning. So that's doing really, really well. One of the things that perhaps should point out, where this tank's situated in the shop, this might be relevant to some of you watching. We've got a big extraction fan, you can see there, and it allows in a little bit of cool air, the cool air trickles in, keeps the tank nice and cool, but the trouble is where it's keeping the tank cool, we are getting an awful lot of evaporation. And what with the extra 25 litres now in the surface area, those coming from, say, a Max Nano to a Max Nano Peninsula, you will notice a higher consumption because of the available surface area. Not Red Sea's fault, just the fact that the tank's bigger and the reservoir's not really changed. You can't put a bigger freshwater reservoir in, but we're finding that this thing needs pretty much filling every single day. So if you are someone who travels frequently, do consider the idea of either, if you've got someone house sitting, great, they can top that up for you every day. If you've not, then many of you, I know with Max Nanos, have used um, a separate auto top-up device when you go on your holiday travel. So you can get some nice auto top-ups these days. I would wire up. Uh, a secondary auto top up if you are likely to travel. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the soft curls that we've introduced to the tank. These were supplied actually some of the frags by a UK hobbyist. We've also got another one from a UK hobbyist as well, which is this beautiful green soft coral, which is a Nepthia species, quite abundant now in the UK reefing scene, but it's actually quite a rare coral. It's a, most Nepthias are sort of brown to bluish, often with the name of Caponella, or as some of you will know, the Kenya tree. But it definitely doesn't come from Kenya. I'm guessing this one is definitely from Indonesia. We've got quite a few cabbage corals in here. We've got both the Indonesian ones. We've also got a Western Australian species, which tends to have much finer polyps. We've got some star polyps in here. We've got some, I can't remember the name of that now. Neospongioid. Yeah, Neospongioides, thank you, Dan on there but we've also got my one of my favorite of all mushrooms that I'm, i've been growing for a while this is an absolute mind-blowing piece some sort of bouncy type mushroom on there very expensive if i remember that one or well, um, there we are there's a couple of babies from it there we've got a cult coral as well we've got some Caribbean light loving Gorgonians, nice and simple as well. Basically that's the whole point, that all of the animals that we're choosing for this are generally regarded as hardy and easy to keep. There are a few filter feeders, we've included a feather duster worm down on there, I do quite well with those and as long as you are supplementary feeding, they're not impossible those by any means of the imagination. We've also got a little golden yellow duster which seems to have made his way out of the sand. And probably something which at the moment is still taking time to adapt. They do do this. We've got some leather toe stalls in here. Now these all came from my personal collection. And they've been sulking for quite some time. They don't like change. So when you buy a toad stall from a shop, this is exactly what happens. You'll often find that they'll go through this period of sulking, producing a skin or a mucus over them. I would imagine in another few weeks time for those to start to open. But we've got some interesting saga fight and toastals in there, some weeping willows and some green mountain dew and things like that. So most of the animals, like I said, are relatively inexpensive with the exception to my rare mushroom I've got in there. But the whole point was to put animals in this system which were easy to keep so that they don't cost you a don't cost a packet and they are quite invasive a lot of them talking of invasive species i've even included a little bit of jasmine polyp down there which is a part of the clove polyp family we have introduced some cleanup crew as well there's a little conch in there but we're going to be introducing today a few more of the cleanup crew and also maybe a fish that's possible as well today one of the things that we highlighted along with the smaller reservoir i'm just barely coping with a top up is that we did feel that we did in the end have to introduce a secondary pump. So what we decided to do 
was to add a, a small J-Cod pump to it. I mean, you could use anything. We decided to opt for a budget pump because we want to try and show you that you can do this as cheap as possible. So we introduced this budget J-Cod pump, which is doing a, a timed wave across the surface. Now, why did we do that? We didn't need to do that with the Max Nano. Well, one of the things I found as we did with the reservoir, the pump is the same stock pump that was on the Max Nano, um, which barely gave this particular display enough flow, particularly for soft corals. It's often misunderstood. Soft corals really do like a lot of flow. So if it perhaps had been euphilia, the standard stock pump would have been enough, but I just felt it needed just that little bit more flow rate. In fact, we may well turn it up more, which will help those toadstools around here that we were discussing. So we may well increase the flow a little bit. But yeah, we've just used the standard new J-Cod pump which has a little controller there's the little controller there we're currently on about 64 percent we could increase that uh, we did get some sand movement when we started to increase the flow of course you're always going to have those areas look where the sand gets blown away but we may have to increase the flow a little bit later on as well because I feel that the soft corals will benefit a little bit more so if we're at 64 percent I may up that to about 80 percent shortly new additions today what we're thinking about today is probably adding a little fish or two we've got some rather lovely little goby species there see if I can focus in on one there we are this is called a, a firecracker goby so we might well go for one of them there he is he's in focus now I might also add a little uh, candy stripe goby as well a nano goby uh, while we're at it we might add a, a lovely little mifrax crab or two also one of my favorite species of all and we're quite well known for these I'm going to add a Jansen's flame pipe fish and I think we've still got one left on the fish system here uh, a little yellow coral goby, often a controversial species. Put one of them in your SPS aquarium and you'll end up with no polyps on your acros. But for a soft coral aquarium, these are ideal. Also, all of the fish that I'm choosing for this Max Nano project are what I would refer to as non-jumpy species. There were fish that will not jump out. That was imperative. Uh, also, I think we're going to be adding some serif snails. Serif snails are very good for clearing up diatoms and problems like that. And we may add another conch or two. And also some astria snails as well. These are really good for helping to control algae. Tank's still too young at the moment to potentially add any urchins to it. I'd love to add him. Look at that. That's a ghost boxing shrimp. You don't see many of them. I may well end up thinking about adding a shrimp or two. But at the moment, I think I'm going to leave the shrimps out of it. Certainly today some mifrax crabs probably a couple of hermit crabs or two we've got some sort of micro hermits in here as well and maybe another little type of goby there's a tank bred zebra goby there i think we've got some linky gobies as well over in the back area over there i don't know if you'll be able to see them so a few more cleanup crew a couple of fish today and i think that will do so we'll get on catching those now and get ready to put those into the max nano peninsula another little fish we might add today as well got all excited didn't i you know impulse buying something i advise all marine aquarists against and here i am doing it but i think we might have this little geometric pygmy hawk as well i think that'll make a great addition to the nano tank and add a little bit more interest okay right well we've had cyrus help me catch some fish we're in the afternoon now so we're going to acclimatize these now we thought we would go completely in a different way get the most out of our max nano space by introducing only fish that get stayed very very small also specifically we chose fish that were unlikely to jump there's a possible exception we've got something called a linky goby in there which is sort of black and white stripy thing they probably can jump it's the only one that at the moment sort of suspicious of jumping but the reason why we specifically decided that we didn't want to include any jumpers is although a jump guard or cover net 
on a Nano is a very useful thing. I wanted to avoid it this time. I, I, I really prefer ribless tanks to not have a cover. So I thought this time, no jumpy fish, a nice, peaceful, small, interesting mix. Maybe not just apparent when you first glance at the tank, but as you look into the picture, you should see those little guys moving around. Cyrus is just checking the salinity now on the animals using a refractometer, just to make sure that the water is correct on the salinity from the display. Uh, so we're ready to start putting the new additions in now. Now it's time to add those uh, items that we said that we needed to improve the phosphate concentration, also give the corals a little bit of food, and also to try and improve the KH whilst also trying to encourage coral line algae. There we go, there it goes, it's got a, a very, very nice looking green hue to it. So we'll allow that to mix round a little bit first and there we go as it starts to feed some of the corals and now we'll add the KH coral line grow. Now this will precipitate a little bit you'll usually find. You put it into high water flow and you'll see it's like a sort of snow almost initially but that should give us the desired increase in carbon at hardness and like I said that will also the KH coral line grow will add a little bit of iodine and a few of those little minerals that coral line algae loves. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. We'll return soon with a another update showing you hopefully the fish settling in well. We might do a little bit on feeding the fish and so forth. If you've enjoyed it, like and subscribe. See you later. Bye. Ooh, baby, baby, baby.